Well, February is just about done. I think this is the last day, and then there's tomorrow. I can't say I have been here in Mexico for a year because we came on the 29th of February. So I can't say that for a few more years. But regardless, we're still here. I've been teaching, or going to teach, didn't get a chance to do that last night. We taught a completely different lesson about the foundation of our Bible and where it came from. We've often wondered why it is that we do not see God move the way we desire to. Many people seek after signs and wonders and miracles, and that's all they want to see. I've seen God do a lot of things in my life, many miracles, many signs and wonders. I've seen him do things that it's impossible to explain. But I'm not here to talk about what I've seen in the last 51 years. I'm here to talk about what is wrong with the Bible. I played the recorded that first service day before yesterday, and I'm pretty positive that there may have been some of you that got very upset about what I had to say. So I'm going to upset you more. I'm not going to sit back and hold back. It's time that you're told the truth. As we go through the history of the Bible, and especially the New Testament, we have to think about what happened and how did we get it. Now, I made mention the other day about Ivan the Terrible, how he was supposed to have controlled the gas chambers of the Nazi camps, and I'm not saying he didn't. But what I was getting at was the evidence that they were bringing up for this man was many decades or many years before they ever arrested him something like 50 years or 40 years, and nobody could really remember what the man looked like. They said that he did the most horrible atrocity in humanity, and I do believe that that man did. But was it the man that was arrested? As time progressed after they extradited him back to, the United, to the, uh, Israel from the United States, they kept saying, well, he looks similar. And they kept trying to take this picture and compare it to him. But when they asked for eyewitnesses, nobody could remember what he looked like. They said they thought he looked like this. And at that point, it began to cause question in the litigations in the courts. If you're an eyewitness, wouldn't you remember the detail? You remember the atrocity, you remember the horrible thing that was done by this individual, but was that the individual? So when I mentioned to Ivan the Terrible, on the uh, class that's up online on YouTube, I was thinking about how much do you remember from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30? If I were to ask you the details of your child's birth, you could remember the highlights, but every detail you would not remember. If I ask you about an exciting event that happened in your life, chances are you would vaguely remember it, but it's a proven uh, theory and it's proven scientifically that your memories are not precise because as time progresses, your memories change. I remember that when I was a young girl, I, uh, I loved to dance and I could do just about any kind of dance that was popular in that time. And because I could do them and I could do them well, my dad and my mom, when we had company, would say, why don't you come out and do the Charleston, or why don't you do the Jitterbug, or why don't you do the, you know, the uh, Jerk, or whatever those things were back then. And I wouldn't want to do it, but in their insistence, I would have to come out and show a few steps of what I could do. Now, this was before I came to the Lord, so let me stress that. I was quite a dancer, and I danced with everything in me, a lot of times in the privacy of my bedroom. I didn't go out to clubs. I didn't go out to school dances. I just loved to dance in my room. Well, as time progressed and I began to serve the Lord and I began to change everything about me, how I dressed, how I reacted, how I looked, I can remember my mother got the story wrong because my mother would tell one thing about me that whenever I got to be about 12, 13, 14 years old, that I would never wear appropriate clothing that my skirts were so high, because that was the miniskirt error, that she was disturbed about it. Well, in fact, that story wasn't accurate. The accurate story was, 
When I started serving God, I wanted clothes to wear that covered my rear end, that didn't expose me. But until almost the day my mother died, she swore up and down that was the kind of clothes I wanted to wear. And yet she would not buy me any other clothes that was modest. She would go buy me things that weren't. And she told me that the day I graduated is the day I would could wear appropriate clothing. So I graduated a year early for that reason and that reason only. And I went in and I'd taken home ec and I started sewing and I made my graduation dress. And I put it under my, my cap and gown. Before we left to go to the school, my mother said, let me see what you're wearing. And I reluctantly unzipped that gown because I wasn't sure what her response was going to be. And she said, get that disgusting thing off of you. I stood there and tears started streaming down my cheeks. Cause you see, I'd been serving God for a couple of years and nobody could tell by the way that I dressed. And I said, mama, you, you told me that the day I graduated, I could quit wearing mini skirts. Please, today I graduate. Let me wear this dress, please. My mother looked at me and she said, oh, okay, whatever, and turned around and walked away. You see, I received the Holy Ghost at 14. I graduated at 17. I just turned 17. So I had been through all of the ridicule about the way I dressed. People not thinking that I was saved because I didn't have anything but mini skirts. And people not kept bringing me down to an altar to pray and, and thinking it was me that was controlling this. And it wasn't. So I've never been harsh on people about their clothing, only if it's appropriate and modest. I got to wear those clothes that day. And why did I tell you that story? Because in my mother's mind, it was me who always wanted to wear the mini skirts. And the reality of it, it wasn't me. So what I'm getting at is I can remember that because it was impactful in my life at 17. It hit me so hard. I made the dress in secret. I did the best I could and, and I learned to be a very good seamstress because back then there was nothing but mini skirts, pants, and there was no clothing that we could buy. So I made everything I wore and I learned to be very good at it. So when I look at example of the Bible, could the events of the Bible be accurate, completely accurate? Now most of you have a debit card on you or somewhere near. And what we have, according to history, we have fragments about the size of a debit card. And they're not complete. They were pieced together and people began to put the story together as they saw fit. The interesting thing about the New Testament, it's written in the language of Greek, the Greek language. But the sad thing about it was through Alexander the Great, the Hebrews had lost their language, the Hebrew language. And they were not even certain what the old Bible, the Old Testament, the Tanakh really said. Because you see, they had been stripped of it through time and history. Some of the first documents that were ever written about the Bible happened about 70 AD. That's 70 years after the death of Jesus Christ. If I can't remember what happened so many years ago, how accurate could that be? And this was always a question in the back of my mind. How accurate is that book? Are we indeed honoring God and doing everything the scripture said? Well, as Alexander took over the Jewish people and he, over a period of time, they lost their native language and began to speak Greek. The translation from Hebrew to Greek was quite complicated because there wasn't enough scholars that had the accuracy of those translations. So what happened then is they just filled in the blank of what they thought should go there. It's proven through time and what I've been reading is actually world history and not any, anybody else's interpretation. 
So since they forgot their Hebrew and they filled in the blank, there was a lot of misinterpretations, inconsistencies. And this is one of the reasons that the Christian Bible is considered almost a heresy because you have so many things that are not consequently correct. I'll bring those out at a later time. But what begins to happen is the Jewish people want to hang on to their Hebrew roots and they're just trying to make it. As the Greek language becomes more prevalent, we see spiritual authorities and leaderships decide they're going to come in and for variable reasons, they're going to adjust it to the government of that time. Now, I say I am not a Christian, and that is true. And Jesus was not a Christian. And that is true. He was Hebrew, a Jewish man. So it was Paul who coined him as being a Hebrew, I mean, a, a Christian in Antioch is when they became Christians. And the day's word Christian is very loose end. People who say they're Christians now sleep around, they drink, they go to parties, they go to clubs. That is not what Jesus represented. He represented the truth of the Hebrew uh, tradition and guides of the Tanakh. When he taught in the temple, he taught the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures. That's what he taught. There was no New Testament. And as far as he knew at that time, there wasn't even going to be anything about him. We find that Paul is the greatest author of the New Testament. But you see, the thing about Paul is he's inconsistent in his beliefs. Jesus constantly states that he is not God, that he is the son of God. You and I are the sons and daughters of God. Jesus reflects this on every occasion. He never declares that he is God. But yet Christians have declared that he is God. As I looked at the statue across in the, the Catholic Church from where our school is, I saw this crucified uh, figurine. And I thought, they never raise him from the dead. Isn't that strange? He's never walking among them. He's always on a cross. And I thought that is such a misrepresentation of God in every aspect. Jesus was not God. And if he walked this earth, he would rebuke you for even making him a God because the first thing he would tell you is you're violating the first commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And he would look at you and rebuke you. So when you say you're a Christian, you're basically saying that the Jewish faith and the scriptures are not worth listening to. And yet that is what Jesus taught every Sabbath, which was Saturday, Friday to Saturday, in the temple, not the New Testament written predominantly by Paul. Paul had a hidden agenda. His agenda was that he would get people under the rule of the Roman government. Now, he was a worshiper of Mithra, the sun god. And Mithra was only governed by the, the Roman elite, Roman soldiers. And in their mentality, women were not allowed in that facility. So when you hear the negativity in preaching about women in the ministry, that's from Paul's teaching about Mithra. That's the reason that they felt like it was an all man's club, if you want to put that, all officer's club. So women were to belittled, and that was the way that Mithra was. God has never belittled, belittled women. He used women in the Old Testament, and he used women up through the years. It's been the mentality of the misteaching of the Christian world that has told them to suppress the woman. I think a lot of it's out of fear and intimidation. I think a lot of it's of their insecurities. I've heard the difference between a woman pastor and a man pastor is unbelievably polar opposites. The woman pastor wants her congregation to grow in the Lord. They want them to flourish. The man pastor never wants anybody above them equal to them. It's a power trip for them. When I think of the writings of Paul and he tells you that you, it's okay to eat uncommon food or un unclean food. Jesus never ate unclean food. 
Now, someone says, well, he says don't go by the law. Let me explain something. There were two laws in that time frame. One was the written law, the Torah. The other was what the uh, priests and leaders made up as they went. So you see what Jesus was rebuking was their adding to and taking away from the actual written scriptures. We, as a nation, ignore the Old Testament. We don't feel like it's valid. Now, there's some things we will not understand. I can agree with that. But there's some things that we must embrace, and that's what we do know. Jesus never ate unclean food. You wouldn't see him eating pig. You wouldn't see him eating these animals that were considered unclean. <coughs> he would be eating that that was necessary at that time. Now, let me explain something, too. In the time of the temple, and they were making all of these sacrifices. Have you ever wondered what all of that food being sacrificed was for? How many have wondered that? I know I did. And I always thought in the back of my mind, that's a lot of food for the priests to eat because they were to eat of it. Come to find out, in some recordings in history, they did that for the community that attended the temple on the Sabbath. Nothing went to waste. You see, they were more determined that nothing would separate them from being in the house of God or in the temple of the Lord. So we, in our time transition, have lost all the principles and values that were written in the word of God. When it comes time now, we've got this Greek translation and now we're having the Roman Catholic Church come in. At that time, it wasn't considered the Roman Catholic. But we have the creeds and councils starting to come in. And there were seven major creeds and councils that determined the Bible that you and I read. Now, I've said this to my son on a number of occasions. I've said, I don't disagree with many of the teachings in the New Testament because a lot of them, if, if you apply them, are, are good principles of life. And if you really knew the Bible, like we should know, you'd find that they're also in the Old Testament. Right. But we're not given the Old Testament because, you know, I got told one time, the reason we don't go by the Old Testament is because we got a newer one. That's why they called it the New Testament. No need to follow after that old book. But I'm going to tell you, this church, this remnant of God, follows those Ten Commandments. And we will live by those Ten Commandments. And I don't care what anybody says, you violate one of those Ten Commandments and you're not, and you do not belong to God. He made a covenant with his people. And the word that he felt was essential through the centuries of time was those Ten Commandments that were written on those tablets of stone. Now we can say Moses wasn't a perfect person, and I think that should encourage all of us, because we're not perfect either. Right. But God handed him down the principles that he wanted to establish for the world. And those principles have been thrown out the door and ignored. So I look at it, although many fragments of these books are not complete, the one thing we all know as a fact is complete is what was in the Ark of the Covenant. Those Ten Commandments. That's our guideline. I see people, because I came out of the United Pentecostal Church many years ago, and all we ever heard preached, and I know Tammy came out of it too, that Acts 2.38, we could quote Acts 2.38 almost backwards. It was preached every single service. And on top of Acts 2.38, the only other thing we were told was that we had to wear dresses, we had to do this, we had, we had a certain pair of dress. That, but it didn't matter what you acted like. It didn't matter what you did. I have known this as a fact. The closer I get to the Lord, the more holy I want to dress. Okay? I don't want to expose myself. I want to be holy unto him. When people expose themselves in their dress, that means they are flirting with the opposite sex. They're enticing that opposite sex, which is not pleasing in the eyes of God. So I've told people, you need to pay attention to how you dress. Your dress is going to be a testimony as to your spirit inside. And we knew all those things. We were indoctrinated completely almost every service. And people really got excited when they started 
doing the clothesline preaching, what we were supposed to wear. The women was put to shame while the men went out and did their carousing about. Most of them wouldn't even walk into a church door. There's not enough godly men in this world. God set upon you as men a mantle, and I want you to listen to this. That mantle means that you are the priest of your family. You're the one who sets the spirit of God in your household. You're the one, not me. Yes, I'm the matriarch of my family, and yes, I do persist on living this before my children, my family, and you all. But my son, and eventually my grandson, my son is required to live for God as a priest in Toshambene Lore Bekanda, in the holiest of holies. He is required. And the only way you could enter into the holiest of holies was if your life was clean. Because if your life was not right and you went into the holiest of holies, they would smite them dead and they'd have to pull them out by the rope and they'd hear the, chain, the bells stop when the sacrifice that the priest gave was not good. Now God's not knocking you out as men, but I'm giving you the, the direction for your family to be complete. You must remember you are the high priest in your family. <coughs> Your example, with kindness, love, compassion, mercy, all these attributes that are of God, that's what changes your family. It's the greatest uh, gift that a man will ever receive is knowing by divine order God set that man over the household. He set them over there. But he doesn't rule with ugliness and meanness and dictatorial mentality. He does as God does. He allows God to work with the woman or the children. And this is why I'm a very strong proponent that men must take their rightful positions in God. Us women don't want to rule it. We don't want to govern it. We want to feel like we can go to a godly husband and say, honey, I'm really going through a hard time today. Would you please pray for me? I've told you countless times, and I'll keep saying it. My deceased husband, Carl, was one I leaned on very strongly. When I wasn't feeling good, all he had to do was look at me. If I went to lay down in the bed, he knew that something was wrong. And the next thing I would know, he would be on his knees beside that bed, praying for me. I never had to say, honey, pray for me. And there were many times when I was going through pretty bad situations physically that he laid himself up by me, not next to me, but by me so he could keep his hand upon me and pray, God strengthen my wife. Oh God, help us get through this. Did it matter how many times he said that? The answer was no. But there was one thing I felt secure in was that my husband was going to pray for me in the midst of every opposition. There's no greater, no greater love than when you extend what's in your heart to your wife, your child, your family. When Papa passed, I said, who's going to pray for me now? Who's going to put their arm out to me? Ask God to strengthen me. He can't do it anymore. Recently, the Lord brought my son to him. Changed him so much. And I look back at him now and I think, he'll take Papa's place. I used to hear my grandmother pray when I would go visit her. And she would call every one of us in prayer. And I would think, when that voice goes silent, who will take her place? Who will pray for the family? 
one day that voice went silent. As I stood there, the question came back across my mind. Who, who will carry out that legacy of mentioning every person and praying for them? Who's going to do that now? If a pastor, you could. Well, yes, but you see, there's a difference. I didn't know all those people she was praying for. I just knew a few of them. The greatest gift that you can ever give your family and your loved ones is that prayer. You can't give a gift more valuable. All the money in the world, all the riches, all the diamonds will never impact as much as knowing that when you put your arms around your loved one that you're praying for them, God strengthen them. It doesn't have to be a long, extensive prayer. It needs to be from the heart. The greatest gift. You see, the New Testament church, the time of Jesus, did not have a New Testament. They knew the stories of old. They knew that if they repented and asked God to forgive them, and they really meant it from their heart, they knew that God would step in because they'd seen him do it over it and over and over again. There's too many people living double lives claiming to be saved, claiming something. But your actions and your words, if they agree, reflect who you are. When does that family mean so much to you that you step outside your own persona and be who he wants you to be? I know I'm not going too fast through this series of Bible studies because there's a lot to cover, but there's so much material online. But what I'm saying to you is set a new precedence. Set a new standard for your home, for your life, that you promise you will never veer from it. Never once in my marriage to Carl did he ever discourage me. And I felt awkward as many times as he told me I was beautiful and I had the most gorgeous eyes of anyone in the world. I felt awkward because I wasn't used to having that kind of compliment. But I miss it today. Now, I really wonder if he'd ask that since I've gotten so much older. I believe he would. What, are, what is the legacy that you're leaving an impact on this world, not just in your families. If you learn to love your families, you can learn to love the world. You can learn to care about them. You see, I was making a statement earlier today. We are ambassadors of God. We are his representation on this earth. How many people do we walk by? How many people do we know that we never mentioned God's mercy and goodness to because we're too busy on our surface talk? Our clowning around, our being Mr. and Mrs. personality. How many times do you look at that soul and go, I need to talk to them about God? The greatest love that you could ever show anybody is to tell him about his mercy, his goodness, and his love. People put God in the Old Testament as harsh and mean and ready to destroy people at every single angle. He isn't that. Or this world would not even exist. He would all went smash and let's start over. But look how much long suffering he's had with humanity. So much long-suffering and he knows we're not perfect we weren't made come to the Lord and immediately got the perfect stamp across our head across across our head <laughs> he knows
knows that we are in a world of muck and mire. On every side of us, there's sin and there's witchcraft and there's destruction. And sometimes you're influenced by it because you don't have the right clothes on. You're an ambassador. I've noticed that many of the presidents of the United States wear a United States pen on their lapel. Most every time someone is filmed, there is that United States pen. They're saying, I'm a, representation, this, I'm a representative of this country. What are you a representative of? Can I admonish you and tell you, I know the presence of God dwells with me. I know that. But that should not be the reason that we do what we do and wherever we are. He doesn't need a calling card. But be true. And I'm going to insert this here because it, it troubles me that in our nation, the people who profess that they're Christians and they go to church on Sunday allow a heathen, demonic individual control their happiness. Dictate to them how they are paying for the people's, they're paying for people's existence and yet they're dictating to the one who's paying it. If you're truly a child of God, why don't you stand up for what's right? Honor thy mother and thy father is in the commandments. What does that say? Well, I'm more or less a mother. I am a mother and I'm a grandmother. But no way does anybody have the right, and you should never allow them to violate that scripture. Honor thy mother and thy father does not mean take advantage of them financially, let them use you, let them do all kinds of things that bring unhappiness in your life. Why do you cow down to the devil? You have grown children that are taking advantage of you, then you take a stand up and you tell them, this is the line. I've had it, no more of this. If you can't stand up and uphold the Ten Commandments, the one that says honor thy father and thy mother, then you will never stand up to the devil. And you'll never walk out of your Sunday church and go worship God on the Sabbath. Because you don't have the backbone to worship and honor God. Now, I said I've talked to different people throughout the, the nation and this is a very common thing happened. They move in with their parent and they pay no rent, they pay no utilities, they pay no upkeep, but yet they can go out to eat and they pay for their going out to eat, but never think about their mom laying on the floor. Or a cot. Or just a blanket. That's not on. And until you take a stand as a child of living God and say, no more, I will not be abused by you anymore, and let it fall where it falls, and if they get radical up in your face, tell them they'll shut it down right now or you will call the police and have a restraining order put on them. Are you listening to me? Like I said, this is going to be out posted in just a little bit. This world that doesn't honor their mother and their father, I'm talking about a godly mother and a father, even my ungodly parents, I still honored as long as I was at home. There came a time I had to cross and step out of my dad's life, but I was much older. My children were grown. Grandchildren had just started being grown because he was very vicious, and I did not like him using and abusing me. He would ask me to fix his computers, and I'd get them running. Then later when he wanted to get mad at me, he'd say, well, you never got my computer running. Well, how was you running it in the first place if I never got it running? Just all this viciousness. Now, if you have a parent, and I'm going to bring this out straight to you, and your parent does not honor God, you are not obligated to that heathen parent to support them, talk to them, or have anything to do with them. Now, we have a lot of that happening. I recently heard a young man who I know and you guys know is Justin. He was taken from the custody of his mother and given to his dad that he never really got to spend much time to. And I talked to his dad yesterday. 
And he said, Justin has just started opening up about the nightmare he lived in. And he told his dad, you are my savior. You saved me from so much. And he's starting to open up. And his dad told me, and through text, he said, he's now got a haircut, because he was looking pretty shabby, got him dressed, he's going to school, he's reading to me at least 15 minutes a day, he's making changes. He said his mother came to visit him, she's a bad drug addict. And he said, he took, she took him into the bathroom and said to him, don't tell your dad, but this is what I'm going to do. So after she left, he went to his dad and he said, please don't let her take me away. I don't want to live that way no more. Please don't let her take me away. And his dad reassured him, we're fighting. We're fighting. And I'm thankful that I and Mike are going to be two of the key witnesses in this custody battle because we know the whole situation and been there and saw what happened. She doesn't deserve to have a little boy when she's strung out on drugs and taking him from one place to another and not loving him. He doesn't deserve to have that life. But when his dad said, I bought him a bike and you should see how happy he is. I told him, I said, I love Justin and I care what happens to him. And I am so glad that you're in his life. He said, he's making so many changes. All Justin needed was some love. And that love made an impact. So what I'm saying to you is if your families are haywire, all they're needing is some love. Right. Some spiritual direction of you being what you need to be for them. <clears throat> I'll get more into this Bible about why parts of it are not correct. And I didn't read any scriptures to you today. I feel like you have to understand some principles in life. Mamas, we got a big job. A bigger job than anybody could ever imagine. To love them little rascals when they're little rascals. And to guide them down the right road. <coughs> I've made the statement, many of you grandchildren, I've never whooped. Okay, Jocelyn was the first and probably she got that. <laughs> well, at least Shaylin and Christopher I never whooped. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the rest of them I might have had to reel in their reins a little bit, but I guarantee you if you ask them if they love me, the answer is going to be, mm. uh -huh. <laughs> No, no, we kind of got stuck with you. I love it when Jocelyn tells me, <clears throat> I'm your oldest and I'm your most favorite. I said, she will never let that die. But each of your children need to know that they're your most favorite. I remember telling my boys, Jeremy, I love you so much. You're the greatest, most amazing big boy. I've ever, ever, ever loved you. It's the oldest son I've ever loved. And then tell his brother, he's the youngest son I ever loved. One day they were comparing notes. And I think it was Jeremy that came to him and he says, Mom, we compared notes. You say that to both of us, just in a different way. You tell me I'm the best and you love me the most as the oldest. And you tell my brother you love him the most as the youngest. I don't know how old they were when that revelation came. <laughs> but the point is, we want to feel special and especially loved by our parents. We don't want to feel like everything we do is a complete screw up. Right. And I think sometimes we focus more on the negative than we do on the positive. How many times a day do you tell that sweet gift that God gave you? You're the most amazing person I've ever met in my life. And sincerely mean it. You must. Just as you praise your child, you must praise God greater. You're the greatest that's ever walked into my life. 
I've been given the privilege and honor to serve. Think about it, church, haven't we? Haven't we been given the greatest gift on life, in life? Don't take it for granted. We'll get more into the detail of the Bible, but let's first establish Jesus was a Jew, and his preference book was the Torah that we know as the Old Testament, but predominantly focused on what is known as the Tanakh, which is the first five books of Moses. Have we followed the wrong leader, Paul, not really having known God, not having ever sat down with Jesus, never was ever in his presence? Are we following the wrong person? My answer is yes. Follow God. Follow after God. Adonai. Some people call him Adonai. Some people call him Yah. Doesn't matter whether you call him Adonai or Yah. We know there is one God and one God only. And in closing, Jesus knew that too. Now go take on the day and enjoy the Sabbath, the day that God has set aside for us.